I suppose you might think that I am a complete idiot, the blindest, most stupid of husbands. But the thing is, firstly, hindsight is always smart. But beyond that, like most happily married men, I loved and trusted my wife. I was completely unaware that the woman I loved and cherished for eight years, with whom I shared so much intimacy and so many happy memories, was a selfish monster. Or, to be more precise, one of the three selfish monsters. Molly's two sisters have been a fact of my life, practically from the very first date we met. I'd never met identical triplets before, and it was both unsettling and exciting to see three who looked alike, or rather, three gorgeously alike, when I went to pick Molly up at her apartment. We met at the grocery store when she asked me to reach the top shelf for some herbal tea that she couldn't get to. Molly is just 157 simile tall, curvy, and voluptuous, with jet black hair that she wears short around her ears. I'm slightly taller than 183 centimeters, so I was the natural person she turned to for help. It wasn't until our fourth date that I found out that she had seen me in the produce section, thought I was cute, and had been waiting patiently by the herbal tea for me to come over to ask for help. It was quite flattering, I tell you. What was even better was that when she told me about it, she was lying naked in my arms, and we had just finished making love for the first time. Our first couple dates were absolutely wonderful. We went to dinner and talked until almost 11 p.m. We walked in the park and fed the ducks, we went to a pretty cheesy chick flick and held hands throughout the entire movie. Pretty corny, right? But I was amazed, fascinated, and bewitched. Molly was the most beautiful girl I had ever met. Sexy, in a good way, the girl next door, with a smile that could melt the heart of an IRS auditor. After I got her tea, she chatted amiably with me, letting me think I was filming her and I was absolutely delighted when I headed to the check coot with a date set for the following Friday. She said something vague about having sisters, but I was not prepared for three beautiful mollies when one of them opened the door and said, Hello, you must be Scott. I was tongue-tied. And you, you, uh, aren't Molly? She laughed just as charmingly as Molly had when we talked at the grocery store and said, No, I'm Hannah. Molly, Amy, and I are triplets. Didn't she mention us? Yes, I probably did, but for some reason I haven't heard anything about the twins. Hannah laughed again. Molly does that sometimes. She just has a little fun at your expense. I'll go get her. Come in. There was another Molly in the living room, but of course, it was Amy. They all had the same haircuts, the same figures, and the same dazzling smiles, so I had no chance of knowing who was who until Molly came out of one of the bedrooms and said, Hello, Scott. Would you like a nice cup of herbal tea? During our first dinner, we talked about everything under the sun, but spent a lot of time focusing on Molly's life as triplets. I was fascinated and wanted to know everything about what it was like. Does she like to constantly see herself in two other faces? Were they closer than most siblings? Could they almost read each other's minds like identical twins should be able to? Have they ever changed their identities to deceive people? I don't know if we read each other's minds, Molly told me, but we are very close. I feel like I can almost always tell what Ami or Hannah is thinking, and they often do the same thing, like answer a question I haven't had a chance to ask yet. We've always been like this. As for deceiving other people, she stopped and smiled at me. I think we've done that kind of thing a little. Have you noticed that we all wear the same hairstyles? I nodded, and she continued. As little girls, we love to fool people. Our elementary school teachers, relatives, even our parents. They also couldn't tell us apart, surprisingly. It was a lot of fun, especially when Amy or Hannah got into trouble and wanted to avoid a spanking. No, Dad, I'm not Amy, I'm Molly, she grinned. You can imagine how it happened. Mom and Dad must have gone crazy. Then in high school, we all wanted to be different. For a while, we were really annoyed that people kept confusing us. So we wore different hairstyles, went to different classes, and did different activities. For example, I was on the yearbook staff, Amy wrote for the newspaper, and Hannah played field hockey. 
but after a few years, we began to lack interchangeability. So we returned to external similarity. Every now and then, I would take a chemistry test for Amy, or Hannah would do an oral presentation for me. It helped us all a little with our grades, you know. She grinned. And there was one time when Brad Hendricks asked Amy out on a date during our junior year. She was crazy about him. And when she came down with the flu on the morning of their date, she was beside herself. She cried and moaned, saying that he would never ask her out again if she canceled it. In the end, she convinced me to be her for one evening. It wasn't hard because it was their first date, and they didn't know each other very well anyway. Starting with date number two, Amy took over again, and they dated for almost a year. She never told him that I was her stunt double. Years later, of course, I recalled this story with a great deal of bitterness. But as I said, at that time I was sitting at the table opposite a beautiful, cheerful, charming girl. I was already crazy about her. And the fact that she seemed to like me, too, was incredible, like a miracle. The three girls had gone off to college and were enjoying living on their own but they also missed each other. So after college, all three moved back to Cincinnati. They found a large shared apartment, and that's where I went to pick Molly up for our date, where I first met her sisters. So we can fast forward eight years. Molly and I dated, fell in love, and got married two years later. I considered myself the happiest person on planet Earth. I had a job at a graphic design firm, and since I had more computer experience than the older guys who ran the place, I was a valuable commodity, so I made good money. We could easily afford a nice three-bedroom house in Oakley Square, just a few miles from our work in the city center. And I think you won't be surprised to know who our neighbors were. Three years after Molly and I got married, Amy married a tall, rather boring guy named Ted, who worked in finance. He was quite friendly, just not very interesting. Anyway, they lived next door to us, at the end of a little dead-end street called Ferdinand Place. Amy and Ted's yard overlooked the backyard of the house on Oak Park Place. And guess who lived there? Sorry, you won't get any points because it was too easy. Hannah, of course, with her husband Arnold. Arnie was the complete opposite of Ted. He was several years older than us, a short, cheerful guy who owned several bowling alleys in the Cincinnati area. He smoked cigars until Hannah made him quit, told funny often raunchy jokes, and was terrific company. They got married a few months before Amy and Ted. It was no surprise to any of the three husbands that our wives insisted on living so close to each other. They were almost like Siamese triplets, joined at the hips. Ted, Arnie, and I were used to them finishing each other's sentences or seeming to say the same thing at the same time. We've also become accustomed to their need to get together every evening and I mean practically every night, to chat before bed. They would meet in one of our three kitchens around 9.30 or 10 p.m., chat a little, and then each go home to her husband. Even after eight years of living with Molly, I could never be completely sure which one was the triplets, and Ted and Arnie admitted that they had the same problem. We have all become very good at noticing what clothes each wife is wearing or who is wearing a particular necklace or earrings. As we celebrated Christmas with Pam and Donald, their parents, it became clear that they had as much difficulty distinguishing between their daughters as we did. This does not mean that their characters were the same. Amy was a little tough, a little more prim and conservative than her two sisters. Hannah, on the other hand, was wild. She drank a little more, told more dirty jokes, and would certainly be voted most likely to be a topless bar dancer of the three sisters although I don't think she ever did. My Molly was in between, and I thought she was perfect, sweeter and more outgoing than Amy, but more level-headed than Hannah. So it's not that you didn't notice the differences between the sisters when we all spent time together. Rather, it was that you could not tell by E or voice which one was which. In another way, it can be said this way. When they wanted to deceive you, you had no chance. Since neither of us had children yet, the vacation was easy to plan. As you may have guessed, Molly and her sisters demanded that the six of us vacation together. So every summer, we took two weeks and went somewhere interesting. Las Vegas or a beach resort in North Carolina 
or Italy for one year. We were a fairly compatible group, so the husbands didn't mind. But in exchange, I insisted on going away with Molly for a week every year, just the two of us, no Amy, no Hannah, no brothers-in-law. At first, this was a real point of contention, and there were some heated arguments and icy silences. Several times passed before Molly realized that I was completely serious. In fact, it took three years before everything fell into place. I love your sisters, and I have fun with Arnie and Ted, but I wish I had time just for us. Is it really that hard to understand? This is my deal. You get a two-week trip with all of us every year, and I get one week with you alone. I must have given that speech ten times. But it wasn't until the day before the trip to Italy when Molly came home from work and saw that I hadn't even started to pack that she gave up. That was the argument. But I firmly said that if she did not agree to spend a week with me, I would stay at home. She and two other couples can go to Italy without me. More than an hour of screaming passed, all without my participation, and about 20 phone calls to Amy and Hannah. Both sisters came to help Molly calm me down, but I did not give in. They were happy to explain to me over and over again how selfish and short-sighted I was acting, and that no loving husband would be so adamant, etc. In the end, Molly agreed to my demand, and we went to Italy. But for a few days it was pretty cold between us and her sisters joined her to make sure I knew I was in the kennel. If it weren't for the encouragement of Arnie and Ted, who secretly rejoiced at my victory because it meant they would receive the same proposals from their wives, I might have given up and flown home early. But by about the fifth day, the romance and beauty of Florence had softened Molly, and the rest of the trip was amazing, like our week on Sanibel Island next winter. After that, every year we spent two wonderful weeks with Molly's sisters and one wonderful week without them. So what's the problem? This all sounds absolutely amazing, right? And so it was. The problem arose when we started trying to have children. Molly and I knew we'd have them someday, but we were enjoying life as a couple, or as a couple glued to two other couples. Too much to rush it. But when she and her sisters turned 30 and I was 32, the biological clock began to tick. She stopped taking the pills, and within a couple of months, Molly and I started making a baby. I had no objection to the goal or the process of achieving it. I have always loved sex with my beautiful, amazing wife. Our sex life was most often intimate and tender, rather than rough and wild. We had three or four favorite positions, and the nights where we spent extra time being playful or creative became fewer and fewer over the years, as I think happens with most married couples. Molly would surprise me from time to time. She would come into bed very horny and much more aggressive, and we would have sex several times a night. We always drank champagne on birthdays or anniversaries, and it always made her even more excited. But mostly everything was more tender and loving, and that suited me. One night after she had just raped me, I joked with her about it and discovered that she didn't like it at all. It was Saturday, and when I returned from the grocery store with food for dinner, I heard her calling me from the bedroom, where I found her lying naked on her stomach on the bed, holding a bottle of massage oil. I'm a little stressed today, cowboy, she muttered. Do you think you could help me? It was amazing. I worked her back and legs thoroughly as she moaned contentedly. Then I turned her over and worked her over, first with my fingers, and then much longer with my lips and tongue until she climaxed three times. Then we had sex, hard, until I finished in ecstasy. For some time, we lay dreamily together. Molly went into the kitchen and brought us some snacks. Dinner seemed off the agenda. And soon we were tumbling around again. When we caught our breath smiling at each other, I said, Wow, that was something, Molly. Then I pretended to be deep in thought. Or wait, maybe you're not Molly. Maybe I just got really lucky with Amy or Hannah tonight. I'm not sure Molly has ever been this excited. She couldn't help but understand that I was joking. But instead of a grin or a retaliatory barb, I received a cold look. Scott, this is not funny. How could you think that I would ever do something like that? 
Do you really think that I will ever share you with my sisters? As she glared at me, I felt the temperature in the room drop by about ten degrees. Molly, forgive me, I said. I was just joking, honey. I reached out to hug her, but she pulled away from me and stood up. I'm going to take a shower, she said, still clearly angry with me, and disappeared into the bathroom. I heard the lock click behind her. For the rest of the night and most of the next day, I remained unnoticed. Molly seemed determined to make it clear that some things were not to be joked about. Finally, at dinner on Sunday, I apologized again, repeating that it was just a harmless joke, and she seemed to relax a little. That evening, she let me snuggle up behind her in bed, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I didn't like it when Molly got mad at me, and I made a mental note to never joke about switching sisters again although it seemed funny that she would react so strongly to it. On our first date, she told me a story about taking Amy's place on a date with a high school student, and I remembered an incident a few weeks before our wedding when this topic came up again. Molly and I disagreed over something small, like which hotel we should stay at for our honeymoon in Curacao. I, of course, gave in to her, but during our humorous argument I suggested that if she didn't want me, then perhaps I would marry one of her sisters. Then she joked back to me. I don't think they'll take you, baby. Both Amy and Hannah aren't very deep sleepers, and I told them you snore sometimes. This will be a deal breaker. Better stay with me. Rats, I answered. Okay, if I can't have Amy or Hannah, then I guess I'll still marry you. And that was the end of it. So I had absolutely no idea why, a few years later, she got so angry when I made the same joke. In any case, as I already said, it was the birth of a child, or rather, our attempt to have a child, that turned my life upside down. We tried and enjoyed it. About ten months. I had heard of many couples who took a year or two to get pregnant, so I wasn't worried at all. But Molly became increasingly concerned about the lack of success, and she insisted that I go to our doctor and get checked. So I did. I had fun sitting in a small room with adult magazines and getting tested, and then waiting for the phone call a few days later. It happened on Friday while I was at work. I closed my office door and talked with Dr. Rendell for a couple of minutes. Well, Scott, you have nothing to worry about, he said. The sperm count is slightly lower than normal. It is about 70% of the average for men at the age of 30, but there is nothing to worry about. Your sperm are healthy and strong, just not as many. You and Molly should have no trouble conceiving, but it may take a little longer than some couples. This was good news, and I was looking forward to getting home and calming Molly down. But for some reason, it slipped my mind. At dinner, we had a long conversation about the politics of the city of Cincinnati, and I forgot about it. The topic came back to me, only at almost 23 o'clock. That evening, the sisters' usual gatherings took place in our kitchen. I watched basketball on TV and then went to bed. I often fell asleep before Molly got up, but just as I was about to drift off, the news about my sperm count came back to me and I felt like I had to tell Molly immediately. So I grabbed my robe and headed downstairs, deciding that I would interrupt the conversation in the kitchen to tell Molly that we had nothing to worry about. As I walked through the living room towards the kitchen, I heard a burst of boisterous laughter from the three sisters through the closed swing door. I smiled to myself, thinking for the hundredth time about how much they were enjoying each other's company, and instead of heading straight to the kitchen, I paused for a moment to eavesdrop on their conversation. It was completely innocent, I swear. I just couldn't help but be curious about what they were chatting about so cheerfully. I didn't have the slightest idea what I was about to hear. Voice number one. Well, if he's not the best, why do you always want to change with me? Voice number two, giggling. I didn't say that Arnie isn't the best. I just said that he doesn't caress private parts as skillfully as Scott does. Voice number three. Or is it still number two? I can't tell. Besides, you greedy cow, you still get Arnie more nights every week than any of us. Plus the weekend, another voice interrupted. So you probably shouldn't complain about your situation. More laughter. I stood there in complete shock to say, 
I couldn't believe what I heard is an understatement. I couldn't believe it. Change? Having sex with each other's husbands? I quietly sat down on a chair, trying to come to my senses, and again tuned into the conversation. Almost a year, and I just don't think Scott can do the job. It must be Molly, I thought. So you have a plan B? Yes, if his spermogram does not return to normal. He got tested about a week ago, so we should know at any moment now. How are we going to do this? No problem. I'll just spend a few nights with Ted when I'm most fertile. Either way, it's a little boring being with Scott every night. And at the end of the cycle, when I'm safe, I want to spend a couple of nights with Arnie. Under no circumstances, Maul, this is not foolproof. You won't get Arnie again until you're pregnant. Laughter. It was too early for my shock to turn into anger. I tried my best not to believe the only conclusion I could draw from what I heard. Molly intended to let Ted get pregnant with his child. I realized that Ted and I were very similar, even though he was three, four inches taller. We had the same hair and eye color and general body type, unlike Arnie, who was shorter and heavier. I sat motionless, terrified, on a chair in a dark living room, experiencing the sudden end of my happy marriage. I could barely think, and then it dawned on me that the coffee clutch in the kitchen was falling apart. I quietly retreated to the bedroom, where I jumped back into bed and lay motionless. As stunned as I was, I knew I could never confront Molly without thinking first. And anyway, who knew which sister would come to sleep with me? So I calmed my breathing, and when a few minutes later one of the girls slid into bed, she assumed I was already asleep. I felt a gentle kiss on my cheek, and her soft voice said, I love you, baby, as Molly often did before bed. It was all I could do not to jump up and scream at her, Oh, you cheating slut! Then how do you explain that you're having sex with two of my brothers-in-law? But I lay still, controlling my breathing. I waited for her to fall asleep. Planning. After a few minutes, I heard Molly's, or whoever's, breathing become slow and regular. But I waited a full hour to be absolutely sure she was asleep before getting out of bed. I thought about how they could pull this off and immediately realized that it wouldn't be difficult at all. If they changed husbands just for sex, they would change clothes during evening meetings. They all worked part-time as co-managers of the interior design store, so none of them left the house in the morning before Arnie, Ted, and me. Changing clothes in the morning would be easy. The only difficulty could be weekends. Either we were sleeping with our own wives on the weekends, I thought, or they were making arrangements to switch to another day. But it would still be possible since the six of us would have a barbecue, brunch, or some kind of get-together almost every weekend, and if not, a quick trip to my sister to pick up the catalog she prepared for me, or under some other pretext. No, figuring out the how wasn't difficult. I was puzzled by the why. You might think that we husbands would have known the difference. I mean, can't you tell your own wife from another woman, for God's sake, uh, but here's the thing. We had no reason to be suspicious. We had no doubt, or at least I had no doubt before, about the identity of the woman in my bed. And there was something else, I realized. Early in our marriage, Molly and I loved to lie in bed at night and just talk, either before or after or instead of sex. We talked about our relationship, about our plans for the future, about work, about our families, about everything. But everything has changed. I don't know exactly when, but a few years earlier, Molly began to discourage late-night conversations. She would come into the bedroom after hanging out with her sisters, and we would just go to bed. We may or may not have had sex, but any conversations I tried to initiate were met with, I'm very tired, honey. Let's talk about this tomorrow. In fact, for years, all of our important conversations, anything we said about our days or plans for the future, took place during dinner or earlier in the evening, never late at night in bed. This was probably a deliberate strategy, since women switched partners. The less conversation there was, the less likely it was that the wife would be caught not knowing something she should or not remembering something from the past. Once I was sure Molly was asleep, I snuck into the office, 
found the ink pad we used to stamp our checking accounts, and dropped some permanent black ink on the tip of my finger. Then, back in the bedroom, I carefully made a small mark on her back, on the right side, about halfway between her shoulder blade and shoulder. It was no bigger than a pencil eraser, and she would never have noticed it if she hadn't looked at her back in the mirror. I went to the bathroom and washed my finger with warm water and soap. As I expected, the ink remained. Even vigorous washing only removed some of it. I worked the pumice stone on my finger for a while longer until what was left was so dull that no one could see it. Climbing back into bed, I smiled grimly to myself as I contemplated my next steps. The worst of the shock had passed, and I was deeply angry. If what I understood from the women's conversation was accurate, Molly had betrayed me, thoroughly and systematically, perhaps over many years. She and her sisters put themselves and their common bond above the duty of love and faithfulness that they allowed to their husbands. I felt used, deceived, humiliated. I tried to imagine how all this could be fixed, but I didn't see any way. On Saturday afternoon, we had a barbecue at Ted's house. I waited until the women were inside, presumably preparing food. Ted was working on the grill while I asked Arnie if he wanted to take a walk around the block. He was always a little concerned about his weight, so he was glad to get some exercise. When we were a safe distance from the house, I said, Arnie, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about something personal for a couple of minutes. Is that okay? Of course, Scott, what's the matter? Well, first of all, let's agree that this will be just between us, okay? I don't want Molly or Hannah or Amy and Ted, for that matter, to know we had this conversation. So if anyone asks what we talked about during our walk, let's just say that I was checking with you about going on a trip next summer, getting your ideas about whether we could go to Greece. Arnie seemed pleased with the disguise. He grinned and said, My lips will be sealed. I'm a little embarrassed, but I wanted to ask about your sex life with Hannah. Molly and I make love about once or twice a week, and I often wish it was more often. I'm just wondering if her sisters have the same thing. Arnie gave me a hearty slap on the back and said with a laugh, I'm afraid you got the short end of the stick, mate. Hannah and I do this every night. Practically every night. I think sometimes we skip a night when she's on her period, or one of us is really tired. But other than that, it's as regular as clockwork. He saw the expression on my face and grinned. Choose the wrong sister, huh? Well, how could you know, or any of us for that matter? I guess I was just lucky. Keeping a disappointed expression on my face to hide the rage I was feeling, I said, I think so, Arnie. Tell me, has it always been this way? I mean, from the very beginning of your marriage? He thought about it. Almost always. Hannah and I have this routine. I guess you could call it a little game that we play. Do you know how girls gather in someone's kitchen in the evenings? I nodded and he continued. By the time she returns, I'm usually already in bed, reading or watching TV. And when she comes into the bedroom, she looks at me with this expression on her face and always says the same thing in a sexy voice. Well, big boy, how do you want me tonight? And I suggest something and then we do it. Almost always, it's the same phrase. How do you want me tonight? I know it sounds stupid, but as long as I'm having sex, I'm not complaining. He laughed heartily, and I tried to join him. One more question, I said. Molly and I used to talk a lot in bed about ourselves, about our relationships and the like. But in recent years, the bedroom has become almost only for sex and sleep. We don't talk anymore. Is Hannah like that too? To a large extent. We seem to save these meaningful conversations conversations about relationships for another time of day. For me, it's not a big deal, I have to say, but I think it's almost like you and Molly. He laughed a little. A bedroom for sex and then for falling asleep. As we walked back to the house, Arnie chatted, mostly about the Cincinnati Bengals, his one great love besides Hannah, and I tried to say yes, I know, and really, at the right moments but my thoughts were far away, in some very cold, dark, deserted place, 
and I was very, very angry. I managed to get through the entire afternoon and evening without breaking down, although people noticed that I was a little withdrawn. I was determined to last another day, so after we left Ted and Amy, I took Molly out for Indian food, her favorite, and spent the evening trying to be a cheerful companion. Around 10 in p.m., Molly, as usual, spent a little time with Amy and her sisters, and when she returned and we were getting ready for bed, I walked up behind her, gently stroked her neck and shoulders, and looked for an ink trail. He wasn't there. Okay, it's all over now, I thought. Damn slut. Whoever you are, it's time for you and your sisters to feel the heat. Honey, I said, how's that scratch on your leg? Let me see. Whichever sister it was, she tensed a little. Scratch? She asked carefully. Yes, yesterday after dinner when you hit the dishwasher door, I said, leaning over to look at her feet. Oh, this, she said, a little too casually. Everything is fine. There's not even a trace left. Yes, you're right, I answered, looking closely. I don't see any traces. This is cool. Back then, it really looked disgusting. I straightened up and saw her practically sigh with relief. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth, grinning to myself. There was no scratch, and her reaction only confirmed that whatever sister was in my bedroom today was not the one who was there the day before. A few minutes later, I was lying in bed waiting for her when she came out of the bathroom. Hey, honey, I said. Let's finish tonight the way we ended yesterday. It was amazing. What do you mean, honey? She replied, looking more than a little wary. Don't you remember? You came downstairs with a sparkle in your eyes and said something like, So, big boy, how do you want me tonight? It was so hot. And I said, Well, well, giving my manhood some credit might be a good idea. And then you pushed me back onto the bed and caressed and teased me until I went crazy. And then you climbed on top of me and rode me like a wild woman. God, that was fantastic. Don't you remember this? For a moment, Molly looked completely stunned. Then a pained expression appeared on her face, and I saw that she was thinking quickly. Of course I remember, honey. I'm just not sure that tonight I'm ready for something so energetic again. Okay, I said. Let's go slow and gentle instead, if you want. But tell me those things you told me last night, okay? She slid into bed and immediately hugged me, pulling me close to her so that I couldn't see her face. Of course, baby, she muttered. I'll say whatever you want. I just like to excite you. What things did you particularly like? I chuckled to myself. You won't get off the hook that easily. Oh, you know, that's it. What you said while we were doing this. She was silent while we stroked and caressed each other. I was instantly aroused, even though I was angry. But, surprise, surprise, Molly seemed to have a harder time getting into the right frame of mind. My usual stroking and so on did not excite her at all. I pulled back to look at her. Is everything okay, honey? I asked innocently. It seems like you're not quite with me today. Catching my gaze, she replied, Sorry, Scott, I guess I'm just a little tired and my stomach is bothering me, probably because of the spicy food. Let's make love, but please don't expect me to be wild and crazy again today, okay? I smiled lovingly and said, Of course, Molly. Let's do it missionary style, softly and tenderly. We can save all your hot words for another night. She kissed me with relief. What followed was completely ordinary, everyday pleasant sex between married people, just as it had been on countless previous occasions with my wife Molly. At least, I always thought it was my wife Molly. Sunday was the day everything went wrong. All three couples had brunch planned downtown at Trentino's, a place we all loved, and then we headed back to Arnie and Hannah's. The men watched the Bengals game, and the sisters talked and laughed together all day. Couldn't be happier. I had Molly at gunpoint all morning, making sure she didn't call either of her sisters ahead of time. I realized that she was very angry, thinking that my Friday bed partner, whoever it was, had not properly informed her about either the scratch on her leg or the wild sex with me. When we were all seated in the Trentino restaurant and the waiter took our drink orders, not ten seconds had passed before Molly looked pointedly at one of her sisters and said, Hannah, 
I need to powder my nose. Could you join me? And they left. Molly with an angry and gloomy look. Hannah with a slight bewilderment. Several minutes passed before they returned. This time, they looked the same, pale and worried. They fumbled with their drinks and kept losing the thread of the conversation. Both of them tried their best not to look at me, but I saw intense glances whenever it seemed that I was not looking at them. As I suspected, Molly must have blamed Hannah for not telling her what she and I had done the previous night. Hannah told her there were no such things, and they both started to worry, very worried. Only Amy seemed unaffected at first, chatting happily with her sisters and us, but after a few minutes she caught the mood. She didn't know what was wrong, but it was very clear that something was wrong. As we finished our eggs benedicts, salmon omelette, and Belgian waffles, she said to Hannah, with carefully considered casualness, Honey, one of my contacts is really bothering me. Could you go take a look? And when they returned a few minutes later, three pale and tense sisters were sitting at the table. None of them looked at me or took part in our conversation. Their nervousness and distress continued throughout the day, to my great delight. While Ted, Arnie, and I were enjoying the Bengals winning a game for a change, the girls were lurking in the back of the house. We didn't hear a word from them for three hours, and when it was time to leave, neither of my sisters-in-law could look me in the eye as we hugged goodbye, and dinner at our house passed in silence, although I reveled in putting on a cheerful facade by telling Molly funny stories about work colleagues or our vacation plans for the coming year. She barely managed to smile or respond in monosyllables at appropriate moments. I could tell she was terrified. All evening, while we were cleaning the kitchen and watching TV, I pretended that everything was fine, and I watched Molly, with fear and horror in her eyes. Around 9.15 p.m., she said, Honey, I'll go see Hannah for a while, okay? Sure, baby. While you're gone, I'll probably pack my things and put them in the car. Of course, I'll need a truck for furniture and stuff, so I'll do that later in the week. The color disappeared from her face. Scott, what... what are you talking about? Why do you need to pack your things? I replied casually, Because I'm leaving, of course. You don't think that I will continue to live in a house with a lying, cheating slut? She gasped and stared at me. Honey, I don't... I don't understand what... I just looked at her and her words were cut off. Of course she understood, but she didn't know how to finish the sentence. See you when you get back, I said, and turned towards the stairs. No, Scott, wait, she screamed, her voice shaking. But I ignored her and went to pack my things. I thought her first step would be to call her sisters, and I was right. No more than three minutes later, Molly appeared in the bedroom doorway and said, Honey, Amy and Hannah are here. Could you come down and talk to us? She looked terrible. Her cheeks were stained with tears, and her makeup was running. She looked very frightened and unhappy. And for a moment, just for a moment, I even felt sorry for her. Yes, I answered, turning away. I'll come down in a minute. I quickly looked into the room for a digital voice recorder, a small one about the size of a cigarette pack that I sometimes use to take dictation notes in the car. I set it to record and put it in my pocket. When I arrived in the kitchen, three women were already sitting at the table, looking tense and unhappy. I sat down, looked from one to the other, and asked, So? There was a long silence. None of them wanted to start. Finally, Molly said, Scott, you know how much I love you, right? Sorry, I said coldly. Which sister are you? I'm Molly, she shouted. Your wife. Oh, really? Please wait a minute. I walked around behind her and examined her back. No black spots. I checked the other two sisters and on one of them she was there. They looked at me with confusion. I sat down again. Okay, I said. For the sake of argument, let's say you're Molly. Then where did you sleep on Friday night when your sister was here? and I pointed to the one with the mark on her back. Lay in bed with me. They all stared at me. Take your time, I said. I'm not in a hurry. I'm sure there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why at least two, if not three, of you have spent the night in my bed over the past three nights. Long silence. Molly started crying, 
and the other two just looked on gloomily. I pretended to want to get up. I need to pack my things, I said. No, wait, Molly said quickly. I'll explain, I'll explain. Just, just please, Scott, please give me a chance to make you understand. I wanted to shout at her that it was too late for an explanation, but I realized that what I really wanted to hear was what she had to say. What kind of twisted rationale could the three of them offer for what they were doing? And, for that matter, will they tell me the truth? I waited, but Molly was crying too hard to speak. One of her sisters started instead. It was just a stupid game, Scott. It started out as a joke and, I don't know, it took on a life of its own. And you, Hannah, look, it was just a tease, a joke, you know, about a month ago. We joked about each other's husbands. You know, what we like about you, what we don't. And we started talking about sex. And somehow we came up with the idea to try each of you. You know, change. It probably sounds like a pretty bad idea now, but we were just teasing each other, challenging each other, like, you're too cowardly to do that. And then, well, after a couple of weeks, things got more serious. Molly and Amy watched Hannah. She continued. In general, everything happened on Friday evening. We swapped clothes when we met here in the kitchen and went to each other's houses. Amy was with you, I was with Ted, and Molly was with Arnie. Then on Saturday, we switched again for BBQ. It was stupid, Scott. We all understand that now, and you're probably very angry. But please give Molly a chance to make amends. She loves you so much. Just look how unhappy she is. She pointed to her sister, who was crying nonstop. So, I said, Amy was with me and Molly was with Arnie? They all nodded. I turned to Amy. So how was it, Amy? How does sex with me compare to sex with good old Ted? Amy looked stunned. I didn't... It was... I don't know, Scott. It was great, actually. Yes? Great. Please refresh my memory. How did we do it? What exactly happened? Amy couldn't meet my gaze. I... I actually don't remember. It was just two nights ago for the first time in your married life. You swapped husbands with one of your sisters, and you can't remember what we did. Do you have early stage Alzheimer's or something? I turned back to Hannah. Nice try, Hannah, but your story is complete nonsense. Yes, it was Amy in my bed on Friday night because I put a black ink mark on her back after she fell asleep and it's still there, but we didn't have sex at all. And I wouldn't want you to try to insult my intelligence on top of everything else you three bitches did by trying to lie to me that it was the first time. You think I don't know that you three recognized Arnie as the best at sex? They gasped, but I ignored them and continued. Do you think I don't know that he has seven nights a week, one of you three and me less than twice a week? But I get the consolation prize, don't I? I get the opportunity to caress your intimate place whenever you want it. I stopped to see how they would take it. Molly was sobbing almost hysterically, and her sisters just looked on grimly. My patience was wearing thin, but I wanted them to admit the truth. You have one more try, I said. Another attempt to tell me the truth, and this time, I want to hear it from Molly. How long have you been cheating on me with each of their husbands? She looked at me, red-eyed, pleading, and I waited. There was silence in the room. Finally, she turned away from me and looked at the table. Many years since Hannah and Arnie's wedding, silence again. I was waiting. Hannah spoke. It wasn't her fault, Scott. Amy and I insisted. But it was only from time to time, Scott, Molly insisted. For example, a couple of times a year. Okay, I said. So what next? Nobody wanted to answer me. So it gradually became more frequent? Yes. Amy answered reluctantly. So, the three of you regularly divided three husbands between you, like in a small round dance? Is that so, Molly? She nodded pitifully. And when did that turn into seven nights a week for Arnie and casual sex for me? She didn't answer me or look at me. How many of the seven nights did Arnie spend with you each week, Molly? One or two, she muttered. Just wonderful, I said. I had already heard all I could stand, and there was no reason to listen anymore. It was just, just sex, honey. 
she said, looking at me pleadingly. It had nothing to do with love. Nothing to do with the way I love you. The way we love each other. About? And nothing to do with pregnancy either, I guess. She was panting, and her sisters looked worried. Scott, what are you... Do you think, I don't know, my dear devoted wife, that you were going to get pregnant with Ted's child because you didn't think I was up to the task? She gasped. No, Scott! And stood up, walked around the table to hug me. I stood up and pushed her away from me, and she tripped over the refrigerator. You bitch! Don't ever touch me again! You betrayed me in almost every way you can betray a husband, with the help of your two slut sisters. Now, the three of you can share Arnie and Ted, unless you decide to add a new guy to your stable. And before they could answer, I rushed through the swing door and out of the kitchen. I grabbed my suitcase and walked out the front door and didn't see them again, although I heard crying in the kitchen. I spent an angry, sleepless night in a Hyatt hotel room, and in the morning I took a day off from work and went to a lawyer, then to the bank. And I made an appointment to meet Arnie and Ted for lunch. I did it so urgently that Ted canceled the scheduled meeting. We sat in a booth at the diner and ordered sandwiches, after which I wasted no time. Guys, I don't know if you will believe this, but our wives cheated on us. More precisely, they moved into bed with the three of us. It looks like this has been going on for several years now. Arnie was completely shocked, but to my surprise, Ted just nodded and said, I guessed something like that was happening. I didn't want to believe it, but we both stared at him. What made you suspect? I said. There were simply too many occasions when Amy forgot something, when she didn't remember a conversation that had taken place earlier in the day or the night before. I wasn't sure, of course, and I wasn't going to make any accusations until I had solid evidence. So I kept notes about what she forgot. I decided that when I have something more convincing, I will talk to you two. Anyway, how did you know? he asked. I told them about the conversation I overheard and then about the ink mark trick. Ted looked thoughtful and Arnie repeated, Unbelievable, Lord. Unbelievable. When I finished, he said, Are you sure, Scott? I mean, it's so crazy. I said, Here is a recording of the conversation I had with the three of them last night, and played the tape without further comment. When it ended, we looked at each other gloomily and then began to talk seriously. Both Arnie and Ted called their offices and said they wouldn't be there that day. I said I was divorcing Molly. There was no turning back. They didn't yet know what they would do. We talked for a couple of hours and I realized that, ironically, I had never felt closer to my two brothers-in-law. They were both great guys and I will miss them. I found an apartment I liked, came back with the truck, picked up a few pieces of our furniture, and moved into it. By the end of the week, I had removed the remaining clothes and belongings from the house. Molly called me repeatedly at work and on my cell phone. I told my assistant to decline her calls and arranged for a new cell number. Keeping my apartment's phone number on an unregistered list also turned out to be a good idea. I filed for divorce and began to make plans for my future life. On Thursday, I had a very strange conversation with Barbara, one of my friends from work. Everyone in the office probably saw that I was distracted and angry, but she still asked me about it. I practically told her the whole story, and her face showed a mixture of surprise, sympathy, and some kind of perverted pleasure. This made me angry, and I told her that. I'm so sorry, Scott, she said. Of course, I'm not happy about what they did to you. It's just... She looked a little embarrassed. It's just... Well, I always had the idea that you and I could, you know, make a good couple. I stared at her. Barbara was not only a good person, generous and funny. She was also tall and very beautiful. I was always vaguely aware of how attractive she was. But I was so in love with Molly that I didn't even think about it. Now, suddenly, it seemed worth thinking about. She and I talked some more. We kept everything a secret, but Barbara saw that I thought about her in a completely new way. Through my lawyer, Molly begged and asked for a meeting with me, for a chance to explain everything. I was sure that she would not be able to tell me anything that could change the situation even a little, but I met with her anyway, and I was right. 
We were in my lawyer's conference room, alone, about six weeks after I moved. I sat and waited when she came in, sad, but still very beautiful. I waited for her to sit down. So, Molly, I said, how are you doing? Are you already pregnant with Ted's child? She blushed. No, Scott, I'm not having sex with Ted or anyone else, and I'm not going to get pregnant by anyone but you. You know, I said, that night when I overheard you in the kitchen, I was just about to tell you that Dr. Randall said my sperm were fine, a little low, but strong enough to make babies. There would be no need to rely on Ted's help. On the other hand, you still had sex with him and Arnie regularly, so I guess it doesn't make much difference. She was already close to tears. Please, Scott, let me explain everything. Can you let me tell you how sorry I am, how terrible I feel? Do you think you feel worse than I do, Molly? She looked at me sadly and shook her head. Okay, I said with a sigh. Continue. But do me a favor. Don't tell me how much you love me. Don't tell me that what you did has nothing to do with you and me. Just don't. Okay? But Scott, this had nothing to do with you and me. It was, I don't know, just a crazy thing that Hannah, Amy, and I did. We've always done this since school. Our little game, not meant to hurt anyone. Have you done this with all your boyfriends? Almost everyone we've met for any length of time. My sisters and I have always been so close. And that, and I think that, I don't know, made us closer. We shared everything. Clothes, gossip, friends, even boyfriends. I sat quietly and let her continue. What the hell? I was learning something. When you and I got married, I thought it would stop. And it did for several years. Wait a minute, I said. Did your sisters have sex with me while you and I were dating? She blushed. Yes, two or three times. I didn't really want to, especially when things got serious between us. But we had always shared in the past, and they were very persistent. Well, I said sarcastically, I guess I passed the test because you didn't leave me. She didn't say anything. Molly, you just don't understand, do you? You played me like a fool just so you and your sisters could have fun. You've been having sex with Arnie instead of me, for years, because he was better in bed than me. Have you even thought about how this makes me feel? What the hell is so good about it? No, wait, don't answer. I don't want to hear it. Her lips trembled. Scott, I know it was terrible, but you know, you also had sex with all three of us. But I didn't know that. You dumbass, haven't you realized this yet? Even if we talked about switching places, which I would never agree to, but no matter, if we decided to do it, I would get pleasure and excitement from sex with other women. But I didn't know that it wasn't you, Molly. For me, it was always you. Not someone new and exciting, just the woman I loved more than anything in the world. I was getting more and more irritated. How could she understand so little about what she and her sisters had done? Listen, I said, it's simple. I was your husband. You should have put me above everyone else. Our relationship should have been above your relationship with anyone else. But that did not happen. You put Hannah and Amy above me. You put sex with Arnie above me. You were going to get Ted pregnant without telling me a word, for God's sake. And now, you can have them. But you won't have me. I've truly had enough. I stood up to leave the room. Sobbing, she said, But baby, I don't want them. I don't need my sisters. I need you. Well, I said, isn't that nice? After all these years, you decided to choose me over your sisters. But now it's not you who chooses, but me. And I choose to be without the woman who lied to me and cheated on me, who made a complete fool of me for years. Happy life. She buried her face in her hands, crying loudly, but made no attempt to stop me as I headed for the exit. After this conversation, it suddenly seemed to me that life would be easier further. Barbara and I started dating, and after the third date, I discovered that there were other women in the world besides Molly or her sisters with whom I could enjoy sex. Barbara was energetic and grateful, and our first night in her bed turned into an entire weekend. It was hot, it was fun, but I had no idea if it would lead to anything serious, but it sure as hell made me feel better. We still date and have sex often, but we're not in a rush. Barbara is smart enough to understand how confused I am right now. 
and she doesn't put any pressure on me, which I really appreciate. Arnie decided not to kick Hannah out, not that surprising, I guess. After all, he was the girl's first choice in bed, and revelations about what they were doing weren't as devastating for him as they were for Ted and me. But he forced Hannah to grow her hair long so that she could never switch with her sisters again without his knowledge. He told her that if she messed with him one more time, with me, Ted, or anyone else, she would be penniless. And he said he wouldn't mind continuing to have sex with Amy or Molly from time to time, but when he wanted, not on their schedule. Arnie told me that Hannah looked pretty pissed when he said that, but she kept her mouth shut. She knows she's on very thin ice right now, he told me with a grin. Ted found a way to hurt Amy the most of all, even though he didn't do it intentionally. He got a really good job in Chicago and told Amy he'd be moving there in three weeks. You can move there with me and we can find a counselor and try to fix our marriage, he told her. Or you can stay in Cincinnati with your sisters. Choose. Now Amy is suffering. She can't let Ted go. But she also can't live without her sisters. Damn bad if you ask me. Fuck her. Fuck all three of them. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.